If you have a Bible today or an iPad or an iPhone or look at the screens, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I'm beginning a series called, Who Are You?, And the reason I'm beginning this series is to answer that question by talking about several things here. First of all, the authority we have as believers, the power that's been given to us in the name of Jesus, not in ourselves. But as we launch into this series and as we launch into that subject, we want to address really the first thing about who we are is understanding the spiritual warfare that we face as believers. Uh, So many times people have a misunderstanding and absolute uh, misguidance, if you'll allow me to say that, when it comes to understanding the spiritual warfare that's happening every single day. And let's look what it says here in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. It says, brethren, or brothers and sisters, it says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Notice what it says in verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the strategies. Everybody say strategies strategies of the devil. Notice that. Uh, there's, there's plans that the enemy has for us. And so, so many times we're, we're just, uh, when it comes to Christianity, there's certain churches that just do not teach this. And again, I'm not looking for a devil under every single rock, but we have to pay attention and have to realize and recognize there is a spiritual realm and we're dealing with that. Notice what it says in verse 12 that clarifies it greater than I can. It says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So here's the whole foundation of what I'm going to share with you for the next couple couple minutes. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not your neighbor. It's not your co-worker. It's not your spouse. It's not this, that, or the other. There are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age. And again, they don't live in Africa or India or in other parts of the, na- of the world. They do live here among us. And it says, that, notice what it says, and it gets every spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. And you got to realize and recognize that pressure and those situations that may cause these kind of forces to come at you. And I want to show you over the next couple of minutes how to do just that because many Christians have this humanistic viewpoint when it comes to spirituality that everything happens only in the natural and the physical realm. And that's just not true. There is a spiritual warfare going on. As a matter of fact, spiritual warfare is greater than physical warfare, in my opinion. The times that I've been to Congress, and the times I was doing more work, especially with Senator Rand Paul and Congressman Duncan Hunter and going to Washington, D.C., these things that I'm talking about were really made manifest every time I'd visit the Capitol. You could feel the pressure. You could feel the pull. You could feel the demonicness of some things. You could also feel the Spirit of God in certain areas, but you could feel that warfare going on. And uh, you could feel it in other places. Um, You know, again, there's places I visit, for example, uh, when I was at another church on staff many, many years ago, we used to, uh, well, we wouldn't picket abortion clinics, but we would stand outside them to solicit the girls that there's an alternative and a better way. And you could just feel the driving spirit in that place. And even when you would go by that place, I happened to live near one of those clinics when I lived in Montgomery. Oh my gosh, that place just, just it just was evil to me because they were killing children in there. Little babies were dying in that place. And you could feel the wickedness. And when I worked at the state capitol for two years in the, in the state senate, I mean, you could feel the realms of darkness and the warfare going on. But if we ignore these battles, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you what, and put them aside and say it's not a battle, we're fooling ourselves. As a matter of fact, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, notice what it says in beginning in verse number 4, really verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. This, this will clarify it even better. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, notice this. This is in the New King James, and this is point number two, that the battle is for your mind and the mind of every person on this earth. I mean, the battle is for your mind. It's for your way of thinking. And Satan can get an influence in your thinking through either using media or using other kinds of avenues to influence your thinking. He can, if he can defeat you mentally, he can defeat you spiritually. Notice what it says here in 2 Corinthians 10, 3. It says, even though we walk in the flesh, everybody say the flesh. Notice that. Even though we walk in the flesh, we don't carry our warfare according to the flesh or using mere human weapons. So what's it say in verse number four? It says this. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they're what? Mighty. Everybody say mighty. 
So they're powerful in God for what? The overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. So if you're in a mental, spiritual battle, I've got good news for you today. You don't have to be a theologian. All you have to be is a Christian that believes in the authority and power in the name of Jesus. And something good can happen, but you've got to exercise that authority. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but nine times out of ten, most believers, what they're doing is they're asking God to do something that he's given them the authority to do something about. For example, I sit on the board of the Tarrant County Sheriff's Department. We're actually meeting tomorrow night in one of the meetings. And, you know, these officers that work for me or work for this board that I'm a part of, we pay them under a contract law uh, situation is what we call it. I mean, they're to enforce the laws of this county, or excuse me, uh, Tarrant County. And, uh, you know, we ask them to do their job. We pay them and we go over the records and they don't need to be calling me or this board to enforce, you know, traffic stops or crime or any other situation. They've been given the authority. I mean, they have my number. They know where I live. They know what I do as far as being a board uh, director. But yet at the same time, they don't need to call me. They just need to do their job. Well, we're, it's the same thing spiritually. We're calling God, saying, God, do something about the devil. Do something about this. Do something about that. When he's already done something about the devil, we've got to exercise our rights and exercise our position. But if we don't, if we don't do that, we're going to get defeated every single time. For example, all right. Uh, Zero Energy has the power, uh, supplies the power of this building, okay? We pay that bill every month, and we, we do well because we have a well-insulated building, and I'm thankful for our, for our bill with them. It's, it's reasonable. However, we didn't walk in here this morning and call Zero Energy and say, would you cut the lights on? What did we do? We flipped the switches. The power was what? It was already here. All we did was flip the switch on. And it's the same thing spiritually. You got to flip that switch. If you don't flip that switch, I'm telling you what, the power's not going to be on. You're going to sit in the dark. <laughs> anyway, hey, listen to this. God is trying everything he can to influence you towards himself as far as righteousness, redemption, sanctification, the power of God, his presence. But Satan, on the other hand, is doing everything he can to pull you away from that. And he's trying to get you to have that stinking thinking. And uh, I tell you what, when you have that stinking thinking, it robs you of God's best. I'll never forget back years ago, um, I, I, I've, I've studied his life recently, but back many years ago, it made an impact on my life. But J.D. Rockefeller, which is still the richest man in America, who was a believer, as a matter of fact, I think he's at $450 billion. I mean, he died in 1937. But anyway, the Rockefeller family is just amazing as far as they're giving and honoring the Lord, especially Mr. Rockefeller Sr. He was a tither and a giver. This is back in 1837, I believe he was born. And uh, he died, what, 1937? Anyway, he lived about 98 years old. But anyway, uh, he was a tither and a giver. My grandfather, though, had a business underneath one of his businesses. And it blessed me when uh, a couple of years ago when I had some stuff in my parents' house. I found some of these log books or accounting books of my grandfather's business. And I knew that he'd been a part of the Rockefeller you know, empire. And I knew he'd been one of their corporate businesses and owned that business. And I knew Mr. Rockefeller was a tither, but I never knew how it would direct, directly affect my life, his example to my grandfather. Well, my grandfather on his uh, books or whatever, he listed at the top of all of his expenditures, his tithe right off the top. And I turned from page to page, and I've got that book in my office. It's a treasure to me. And it really showed me, back beginning in the Depression days, how my grandfather built a business, and he tithed his way through the Depression and was successful. And I'm thinking, wow. And he learned that from Mr. Rockefeller and, and the principles from that. And I'm thinking, what a heritage, because I learned that from him. He was my example because I'll never forget, right after I became a Christian, I visited his church one time, and my grandfather was the head deacon of the balcony, which is this massive balcony in his Baptist church. So I went with him that Sunday morning, and always in his pocket, he put his tie check. I said, Papo, I said, his name was Papo, his name was Taff Rudd, and my son Benjamin's actually named after him. And I said, I asked him, I said, how long have you been doing that? He said, I've been doing that from the very beginning of when I learned it from, from, from business-wise. I learned that this was a part of my life. I don't do it because I'm Baptist. I do it because I honor the Lord. And man, it made such an impact on me, and it broke something in me. 
it broke something financially in me when he said this, I'll never be without a day of my, in my life because of this check. Because if I honor God, he'll honor me. And nothing good will happen to you when you honor when you honor God, nothing bad will happen to you. Man, it just changed my life. It just broke a mindset in me, ladies and gentlemen. And, you know, I learned about tithing not shortly after that, of course, in the Baptist church and all that. And thank God for what I learned. But it was the legacy and the mindset that was passed down. It was that, you know, again, somebody coming out of the Depression, somebody, somebody coming out of poverty. And then my grandmother on the other side, she had a business too. But after my grandfather died, he didn't want to tie the business. And the business was okay. I mean, it was successful. But when he passed away, she lived another 25 years after him, the business doubled and tripled because she tied and gave. And so Josh Lehu, where are you? Come on up here, Josh. Let's give Josh a hand. Josh is going to share with you. <laughs> Grab you one of those mics. Josh is going to share with you what happened to him recently because he fought a mindset. He fought this pressure and I've known Josh and some things he's gone through recently that were hard on him, especially mentally and uh, spiritually. And, uh, you know, Josh, you were having to deal through a heavy legal expense at the time. Well, still are to a certain degree and a lot of other things. But, you know, you never backed off this principle. You never backed off what you believed in your heart. And, uh, you know, I, I, I felt for you because, man, you were paying out a lot of money for a lot of things. But God did something special for you, and uh, you broke this mindset because I could see the pressure on you. I could hear it in your voice. When I saw you, I knew, I knew that you were internally be, dealing with, am I going to continue to do this? <laughs> Is it going to break me or make me? What happened to you? Share. And look uh, at that camera and tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, this is a... This is a different perspective stated up here. Yeah, it is. They, it uh, is. It <laughs> it it'd make a big man nervous. Um, oh, I saw it. I know no, it, we, it. It does me too sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm all right. They, uh, Go ahead. Over the over you'll, the. you'll be all right, Josh. You can make it, man. <laughs> you, you, you little man. You little man. Y'all can make it. All right. It, go ahead. I know go it. Ahead. Go ahead. Over, over the last, it's been 18 months now. Um, it's been. Well, you know, it's been one thing right after the other. <laughs> sure I mean, just, just one thing right after the other. Um, overall, when it comes to tithing, I would say it was roughly about three years ago. Right. And I'll make it real quick. That's but all right. roughly about three years ago, I was at my, the same job I'm at now. Mm -hmm. And my boss came up to me and informed me that they were getting ready to cut my pay by roughly $20,000 a year. Mm. That's a tough one to swallow. Yeah, it is. They, uh, wasn't a whole lot I could do about it. Wasn't a whole lot I could say about it. I called pastor. Yeah, you did. I, I called pastor. Right. Um, and pastor told me then, and it was kind of a tough one to swallow, um, but he told me then, he said, well, Josh, you haven't been tithing. What do you expect? What do you want God to do for you? If you're not honoring God with your money, what do you want? How's God going to honor you? And he told me then, he said, I recommend that you sit down and you pray and you give, give this to God. You give your finances to God and you talk to God and let him know that you're going to do your part and you're going to trust him to do yours or his. So I did. That was a Friday, I believe. Yeah, it was. The following Tuesday, I was supposed to be having a meeting with my bosses where they were going to let me know just how bad my pay was going to be cut. I sat down in the meeting, and I tithed that Friday. Didn't, didn't really have the money to do it. I had bills I had to pay. I didn't have it, but I did it anyway. I went into the meeting that Tuesday, and uh, my bosses sat down, and they said they looked at it and looked everything over, and not only were they not going to cut my pay, they were going to give me a raise. <laughs> So, they, uh, <laughs> as I continue tithing over did. over the the last several years, there's been again one thing right after the other. Right. Um, but you always made it through those things. Oh yeah, absolutely, and never, never one time did I ever. Once I started tithing, never one time did I ever miss anything. No, never. you would call me and say, Pastor Brian, I'm going through. This is hard right now. But he said that his words would always be, it's hard right now, but I'm not going to quit. Uh, I'm going to continue on. 
Because no. he, he got a revelation of this. I mean, I could see this spiritual warfare going on. And, you know, and I wanted to say, sometimes I want to say, man, you know, with those kind of expenses, you keep your tithe. But I'm like, I can't do that. I really can't do that because that's, that's wrong. But anyway, and well, then, you, then you started escalating into a major situation, which put a lot more pressure on you. Yeah. So 18 <laughs> months ago, I had, I had to start a legal battle. That's true. Um, mm. And attorneys are not cheap. No, at all. No, they're not. <laughs> Even if you find a cheap one, they're not cheap. They're I can probably say that. No. Um, and you got into a heavy legal situation. It was some lot. It was big, big finances. Absolutely. So they uh, going through all that. They uh, the court started ruling against me. Right. Outside of outside of what. I think was right or, or <laughs> yeah. it just was what it was. And at, at one point it was December. Yeah, it was December. They, uh, the court hit me and told me I had $3,500 a month. I had to pay out every month. Plus the lawyer fees. Plus the lawyer fees. So my, in fact, my attorney actually let me know and he informed me that mm, I'm sorry about the ruling and that's a terrible thing, but, um, you owe me $4,500 and it needs to be paid or I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to drop you. Right. And you're taking care of your kids. Yeah. You had the responsibility um, to do that. And we had Christmas coming. That's so, it, right. you know, it was the end of November, beginning of you December. You talk about spiritual pressure. I was watching <laughs> him go through this, and I'm thinking, whoo, this is either going to make him or break him. Well, um, but I left it up to you. You well, knew my it, position, and you knew the Word of God. But I, And I made it in my heart that if you walked away and wanted to give it up for a while, I wasn't going to say anything to him. I wasn't going to chase him. I wasn't going to do anything. I'd made that his decision because I thought, this is a lot of pressure, even though he knows my position. But then you came back, and some, this is what well, happened. And, and I, I sat down and talked to Richard. Right. Um, Richard yelled at me. <laughs> he did. I'm not going to lie to you. He did. Um, well, I let him do that. You know, and, and the thing that he told me, and I'm not ever going to forget it, because so. it, it really, really kicked me in the butt, was... He sat down and looked at everything, and he was like, you know what? It's going to be tough, but you can get through it. <laughs> no, this, this, <laughs> no, this isn't right. It wasn't right, but legally. But he said, look, God didn't promise that we wouldn't go through the fire. Right. You don't think it was tough for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? <laughs> That's exactly you, preach it. You know, and he said, but God promised he would be there. That's and right. he was there for them, and he's going to be there for you. That's right. And you're going to get through it. That's right. And... Uh, like I said, he yelled at me. <laughs> they, uh, and I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I purposed then when I left after I calmed down. <laughs> yeah. After I calmed down, I purposed that I was, you know, this, this wasn't right. Point. And I wasn't going to stand by and just, I don't know what I was going to do, but God was going to make a way. Absolutely. Be it another job, be it a side job, be it whatever right. the case may be. Right. God was going to make a way. Yes, he was. They, uh, I had made a sale at work. Yeah, and you told me about that. And uh, when I made the sale, it was a sizable sale, and right. typically I would get commission off of it. Right. My then you called me, and then, then not only with the bad legal situation really against you, your boss calls you, and what yeah. happens there? Well, my bosses let me know that, mm, sorry, we can't afford to pay commission on this. So and I was like, man, this, <laughs> what's <Yep>. going on? <laughs> I was like, man, this is really weighing against him. They, uh, so Amy and I prayed about it. You know, we we just decided we're going to get through it. One way or the other, we're going to come out. Right. God hasn't let us down so far, and he's not going to start now. That's right. And uh, and you just kept, you kept with your giving, you kept. Yep. Um, so I believe it was the second week of December. It yes. was a week before Christmas. That's right. Um, because we were trying to figure out How to do what, what, what we were going to do, do for Christmas. Christmas. That's right. So a week before Christmas, my boss called me and let me know that they were giving me a bonus. <laughs> that that covered the attorney fee, it covered the, the money that I had to pay out, and it covered Christmas. That's almost right. to the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, and so far, every month since, mm -hmm. the, the amount of money that we're having to pay out right now is ridiculous. You don't even want to think about it. They, uh, <laughs> but not only has God covered it, mm -hmm. he's kept us 100% through it. 100%. <laughs> Um, Amy. Amy can tell you. I mean, even even in the motorcycle club, yeah. you know, I, I've got when you when you take your car to get the oil changed, it's what thirty forty dollars. You know, the motorcycle is three hundred fifty. Whoa! They uh, so I took my motorcycle to get the oil changed and get it tuned up. They let me know I needed new tires. You need to go to Toyota. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. <laughs> 
They, uh, but before before I even knew that I was going to need tires, right? They, uh, God made sure we had the money to cover everything that was right. going to need to be covered with it. That's the he's he's taking care of us one hundred percent. And it's will, Josh. they uh, when God says in the Bible, you know, to tithe your money and to try them, mm-hmm. He means it. He does. And there's not one time that He has ever since I've started tithing that He has ever let me down. Yeah. And I went from and I made good money when I started tithing, but yeah, I, I made, went from paycheck to paycheck, and there was nothing I could do, no matter what. No matter how hard I tried to save, there was always something that came up. Always. Yeah. And once I started tithing, there's still things coming up. Right. But there's a grace not, not only has he covered it, he's given me back what I've lost. That's right. So. Amen. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Josh. Thank you, man. Congratulations. Give him a hand. Isn't that awesome? And the reason I asked him up here was that, yeah, it was the principle of the tide. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's important for you to hear. It's the battle. It's the warfare. It may be healing. It may be a family member. It may be a spouse. It may be whatever you're going through. It's that, that pressure of breaking you to, to get you to compromise what you know is right. It's hard. It's not, and again, tithing is a hard thing because money is, you know, you work 40 hours or more than that. And this, you know, you got these expenses and you think I'm giving this to, you know, to Pastor Brian. He, he doesn't need it. Well, it's not, it's not, you're not giving it to me. If you think you're giving it to me, you're, you're missing it. You're giving it as unto the Lord. That's what Mr. Rockefeller, that's what my grandfather taught me. That's what others have, what others have taught me. And that's what I endeavored to show Josh. And that's what he got. He got, I'm doing this as unto the Lord and not Pastor Brian's going to meet my need. The Lord's going to meet my, he's going to fight my battles. You know, I, 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 I remember a year ago sitting in a hospital room thinking, man, this is getting expensive trying to get my heart into perfect heart rhythm. And uh, the bill comes out to be $423,000 total. And uh, my insurance is only covering a percentage of it because of a major medical policy I had at that time. And I stand here today and I just, you know, with a test last week that my heart is in just excellent health. I mean, perfect health for me and perfect health for any person. And, uh, I, and, I, and I got to thinking about it, you know, I'm not paying any medical bills. And all that pressure last year thinking, you know, I'm going to have to, I'll be care- you know, even one person came into the one in my room that, and said, you listen, with all this medical thing, listen, you'll be carrying these bills for years and years and years. You're 50, uh, 55 years old at the time. You'll be carrying it till you're probably 60 or 70. And don't worry about it. You pay it off when you're 80 or 90. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and here I am. You know, not even, it's not even been a year. And uh, it's paid off because the faithfulness of God. But I'm telling you what, man, when that pressure is on, that pressure is on. What's it say over here in James chapter 4, verse 7? Let me show you about uh, what do you do. And again, it may not be money. It may be another issue. It may be a temptation outside of money. But money, money is, a, is, a, is a powerful thing because it can influence you good or bad. Notice what it says here in James 4. Satan can't control, can't, cannot control you outside of your will. He cannot do anything without your cooperation and consent. But what's the Bible say to it in James 4, 7? It says what? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you. Now, let's just flip that around. Yes, it says to submit to God. That's what Josh did. That's what we're supposed to do. But it says resist the devil. Now, I've got a question for you. Watch this. In that situation, let's put money aside. Maybe it's something else. Maybe Maybe you're a worrier. Maybe you're what, maybe it's, uh, it could be a hundred different things. Maybe it's an addiction to something. It says, if you resist the devil, he will flee from me. But what happens if you don't resist the devil? What's, what's the opposite of that? He's not going to flee. He's going to stay. He's going to harass you. He's going to do everything he can to break you down. And I know about that financial pressure. And I understand that. And I understand other areas where it's financially pressured. Where you like, for example, I'll never forget when I first got a revelation of this, I wasn't a heavy drinker at all. As a matter of fact, I didn't drink at all. Even though I was in the music business, just wasn't something that would it. But people that I knew, that especially one of my musician friends that was, a, was an alcoholic, I mean, he just could not stay away from it. I knew the best thing after I got saved, even though I was departing from the music industry, the last thing he needed to do was play in these bars on the side. And I said, you got to stay away from that environment because that environment, every time you go into it, you're not resisting, you're yielding and it's killing you. It's destroying you. And uh, anyway, I mean, it's the same thing here. If you don't resist, 
if you don't say, Satan, I, I'm not, I'm not going to yield to this temptation. I'm not going to give myself into this. I'm telling you what you submit to God. And notice what it says here. It says in verse number eight, it just says this. I like this. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Lord, when I, I, I'm giving you this situation. I'm giving you this desire, this thing that's bothering me. And I refuse to put myself in a place of compromise. Notice what it says, my next point here, number four. It says, your unwillingness to engage in a battle. This is just a, a statement. It says, your unwillingness to engage in a battle doesn't mean a battle isn't raging. It just means you're going to lose. <laughs> that's a pretty powerful statement. I like that. Your unwillingness to engage in a battle-type mentality just means that you're ignoring something that's there, and you're going to get defeated every time because it's spiritual warfare. Every time I go into a hospital, you can feel the atmosphere. As good as it is to know that people are getting healed in a hospital, you can feel the intensity of sickness and disease. Listen, I, back in 2000, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and a friend of mine has a, a very large medical business, and um, it's just a huge business he has. And uh, he's the number one seller of allergy products here in the state of Texas. Just a, just a very successful health business. Anyway, he was showing me in these labs, they had cancer and they had it in these um, live cancer cells. And I'm in there watching it through these massive microscopes and all this digital technology. And he said, Brian, I want to show you how demonic and how spiritual cancer is. And we looked at it for about an hour or two, and I just told him, I said, Rick, I've had enough of it, man. You can see the demonicness of how this disease moves in someone's body. And we were talking about other sickness and disease. And I'm telling you what, just to sit there and say that sickness and disease is natural, yes, it's natural in some aspects, and, you know, I understand that. But also, there's a spiritual warfare. And as believers, we've got authority over that. But if we don't exercise authority, if we don't stand against these things and use the name of Jesus, which I'm going to talk more about in this message later as far as this series, then we're going we're gonna to lose out. There are times when you have to simply confront the enemy and say, in the name of Jesus, enough is enough. You're not going to have my body. You're not going to have my finances, and you're not going to have my life. I'm not going to yield to this. I'm not going to give myself to this. You know, marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman. It's a covenant and to break that covenant with another person opens up a lot of things that you have to shut down if you do that. But you can shut them down and shut them out. And again, the world doesn't realize how powerful the covenant is between a husband and wife. And when you enter into that covenant, it's a bonding covenant. And breaking that covenant, it can't be restored. However, the beauty of it is that you go from year to year and from week to week and literally day from day, day to day honoring that covenant. It's a powerful thing, the institution of marriage. But in our society, we devalue it. We say, well, people can live together or, or do this or that and the other. and We'll try this out. Listen, there's no trying marriage out. Marriage to me is not a contract. It's a covenant. I made a covenant with Sheila on September the 16th, 1995, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. She didn't get there until 20 minutes till, so I didn't know she was going to make it to the ceremony. <laughs> the Morris have a tendency to run late. That's why I bought Sheila a car after we first started dating, because I was going to be there on time, then I would cover for her when she was late. <laughs> so that's a whole other side note. Anyway, she's getting a lot better at it, 25 years in our relationship, because I've been praying in the name of Jesus and changing the clocks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm a, I'm a good husband. <laughs> the time change next week, I change all the clocks. She's all getting there about 30 minutes early, right on time. I, well, she says, where's everybody else? I said, doesn't matter. You're on time. The rest of the family, they'll be here on that African time or more time. Here they all come in here about 30 minutes later. Hey, we're all here. Seriously? Seriously. <laughs> That's a whole nother message anyway. But seriously, you, <laughs> I tell you, there's a spiritual message in that too. If you want God to be on time, you need to be on time. Amen? <laughs> seriously. I mean, I mean, you know, we won't come on, God. I need you now, but you're going to be 15 minutes late coming in here at, at 25 after with your cup of coffee spilling in everywhere. I'm, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here too. But the service started at 10 o'clock, not 10.30. Oh, I left the house at 5 after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you this. That time I was invited to the White House to meet with President Bush, I didn't get there. I got there three hours early. <laughs> so... 
Because Doug Weed told me, he said, if you're late just to go through the inspection at the gate, they're not going to let you in. And so, listen, that, that was an awesome event to go to the White House. But let me tell you something, meeting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, because you come in an environment like this with all that spiritual warfare going on, and you in that, enter into that worship time we have here and let God speak to you, there could be a word dropped, dropped in your heart. There could be a time during communion. There could be a time reading the scripture that you could say, you know what, I am going to win this battle. Listen, what Josh was sharing, yes, maybe that's a financial situation that's a little different from yours, but it's the principle of the fact that he stood against the pressure. Okay, let's just set the tithing aside for a second. He stood against what was trying to break him. And you and I have got to stand against what's trying to break us. And we've got to stand in the authority as a believer. Let me, let, me, let me wrap it up with this. Turn over to Matthew, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, this is Jesus and Peter, and this is hilarious. Uh, G- Peter's sitting here calling Jesus in Matthew 16, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then out of the same breath, in the same instance in Matthew 16, he messes up. And I don't know about you, you can just feel the spiritual warfare that's going on here. Matthew 16, Jesus said in verse 13, he asked men, who do, I, who do men say that the Son of Man am? I, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some said John the Baptist, Elijah, and other prophets. But Jesus asked, said to them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, you've got this revelation, Simon Peter. Watch this as we close with this. You've got this revelation that you're the Son of the living God. Then all of a sudden, you talk about warfare, Then down in verse 21, they're still together. And from this time, it says in verse 21 that Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. And look at verse 22. And Peter took him aside after saying he was the Christ. And look what he said. He said, far be it from you, Lord, that this would happen to you. Notice the next verse. He said, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now he's going from a revelation of Jesus to being called a devil. (laughs) You're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. What Peter was saying is, listen, this is not going to happen to you. You're not going to die. And what is Jesus? And I'm not, please, don't call people Satan, okay? This was Jesus. You can do this. And I know you want to call that co-worker, and I know that sometimes you want to turn to your spouse and say, Satan, but don't do it. Guys, don't do it. Do not do it, guys. I'm telling you what, I'm offering you some severe, positive marital advice. Do not call her Satan. You will be sleeping outside if you do. And you can come over to my house and snuggle with the dog, okay, and then whatever. <laughs> don't do it. But my point is, there is a demonic influence. And sometimes you've got to realize that you're battling for your absolute being. And somebody can be used of God to influence your life. Somebody can be used of the devil to influence your life. How many times have we gone to correctional institutes? I know Dave and Shelby and I have others. I mean, you could just feel it. We have someone here that works in a correctional institute. I don't want to name her name, but she's over here to my right. <laughs> so <laughs> you can stand up. But no, seriously, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but seriously, that, that is a very spiritual place. You know that too. You work there also or did work in one, and even our police officers know that. Listen, man, you're pulling somebody over, and uh, you don't know what's going on with that person. And you can, you can almost feel the demonic presence. Demons are not in Africa. They're in Burleson too, okay? They're just hidden a little bit better. They're, they work in different ways, and they can be very manipulative and very, you know, and very subdued. And you know what? They're not trying to prey on your strengths. They're trying to pressure your weaknesses. When you're strong in an area, shoot, you're not gonna, they're not going to mess with you. But when you're weak, hello, they're going to come knocking on that weakness, and again, listen, there's nothing wrong to being tempted, okay? Jesus was tempted. Uh, the, the, the key is not being tempted. The key is how do you deal with the temptation? You know, back there, simply for me, back in 1992, I mean, excuse me, 1988, I got this revelation, the fact that I heard Billy Graham say, the best way to, you know, never commit adultery or never be alone, I mean, never, you know, as far as violate the covenant you have, I wasn't even married, is to never be alone with a woman. I'm thinking, man, that's pretty smart of Dr. Graham. So I adopted that, got married in 95, and I practiced that since. And I'm like, what a brilliant answer. Just never be alone with another woman. I mean, you'd be alone with your family, you know, whatever. I'm talking about that. But never be alone with another woman. 
It just, it just it eliminates that. It eliminates the questions. It eliminates the problems. It eliminates all the things. That's why there's cameras all in this church. Not because I'm insecure or whatever. I just want, there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide financially. There's nothing to hide physically. There's nothing to hide in my home. You come to my house. The computers all are seen. You know, you can see the monitors, everything. I'm not, I'm not trying to hide anything. Am I tempted? Yes. Of course, everybody's tempted. But at the same time, I'm just not going to give it place. And for those who do give it place, listen, don't run from God. Just run to him. He'll help you and he'll work with you and he'll make this situation right. And he'll help you. And I promise you, you'll go from this situation from being used of God one moment to being absolutely influenced by the devil the next. Like Peter, you'll go to a place where you're consistent and you have the presence of God continually operating in your life. And you feel the fact that you know when the demonic tries to harass you. You know when someone is being used of the enemy to come against you. I mean, you know, I'll never forget that time I was going to an FCF leadership meeting. I'm just going through Oklahoma. I pulled in a love truck stop. I'm just going to use the restroom. Well, I went to get gas, going to use the restroom. It's just a normal part of that trip. I've done it so many times. And this guy, twice as big as I was, you know, in the bathroom, started messing with me. And uh, I mean, start, not, 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 not talking about sexually or anything. He wasn't gay or anything. I was like, <laughs> hi, Pastor Brian. No, I was none of that. I was like... Anyway, I've had that happen before. I'm like, seriously? Oh, God, gosh, seriously? A gay person. Okay, all right. Anyway, moving right along. So I'm like, do I look gay? I'm like, seriously? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's only happened a couple of times. Anyway, but this guy, now he's just messing with me, and he was making some racial comments, and I'm using the bathroom, and I turned around and said, listen, you are bigger than I am physically on the outside, but you are not bigger than I am on the inside. So I'm telling you what, in the name of Jesus Christ, you can back up and back off. And you can hush that foul language because I don't want to hear it. And you can shut that up in the name of Jesus. So if you take a swing at me, you're going to have all heaven coming against you. And you could die right here on this spot, not because of my hand, but the hand of the Lord. I said, I've got to go to a meeting and I'm about 45 minutes late. Now I need for you to get out of the way or you're going to get knocked down spiritually. And he backed off. And I'm telling you what, you got to learn to just take your authority. And I walked out and I'm thinking, man, did I just do that? <laughs> and I think that guy was twice as big as I am. But you know, I was, I was, I was focused on the meeting. I was focused and I wasn't going to cave in. And you know what, you've got to have that. And I got in the car and I thought, well, dang, Lord, that's, that's what drew that? You know, in that meeting, I went to really launch some things of some other things spiritually. And Satan was really trying to harass me and come against me and, and really ruin my, my trip. I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico one time and I was like, I, I've been to this same hotel, the Sheraton, over and over and over and over at this church I used to speak at. And I came in there, I do the same routine, take my clothes out, put them on the bed, put everything, the toiletries, all that. And the last thing I do is put my clothes in the drawer. Anyway, I opened this drawer up and uh, I was like, is this plastic bag? And it was child pornography in there. And I'm thinking, oh man, what in the world is this? And I'm thinking, what? I'm talking about this, 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 this vile, filthy, horrible stuff. And so I took the bag out, got a hotel bag, you know, that they have in the rooms, put it in a bag. And I thought, well, I'll just go throw it away. You know, and just going out. My no, I said, no, I'm not. Whoever was in this room the night before, this is illegal. This is not pornography. This is illegal. And so I went downstairs and showed it to him, explained the situation. And so I went and moved into another room. But while I was in that room, I bound every spirit in that room and everything that was in that room. And I did that. I always did that every time I went to a hotel room. For y'all that travel, man, y'all, man, y'all take authority because you don't know what was in there the night before. But I don't know. I'm in that room this night and it belongs to the Lord. Everything's dedicated to the Lord. And so... My point with all that is, it really showed me because I could, I knew when I, I knew when I walked in the room, I could sense a heaviness in the room already, and I kept, well, what's what's wrong with this room? And I thought, is somebody smoking in this room or something? This is not, not, not smoking, and it wasn't that. And when I did that, I finally felt it, you know, in that, in the fact that it was in that drawer. I'm telling you, you got to watch these things. And I knew that I did the right thing by going downstairs. I mean, what, what, what would happen if the police were to come or somebody to give a tip or whatever, and that stuff had been in that room? I did the right thing. I called Sheila. I said, this stuff was in the room. I moved to another room. You just got to be aware of those things, okay? They're little traps. 
when I used to travel on the road. Not that I'm Tom Cruise or anything, but just things would happen. I was in uh, Peoria, Illinois one time, and this woman, she came up to me. I was back there in the back. I was getting my mic on. I traveled from another church. I'd spoken three churches that day. Did two services, drove to Peoria, got there at five o'clock, checked in the hotel, got to change clothes. And then I'm coming to this service. I'm in the back, in the back, in the pastor's room. They're doing the worship, and I'm putting the mic on. I'm putting the mic on a lapel mic. I mean, a mic like this. And I'm getting dressed. All of a sudden, this knock on the door. I thought it was the usher. And is this girl come in? I said, excuse me. I said, I'm here just getting dressed. I'm getting going. She said, I know you're back here. My name is so-and-so. I said, well, it's good to meet you. But I said, you need to leave because I need to go out. She said, well, I'm going to shut the door. I need to ask you a question. Do you find me physically attractive? I said, you need to open that door, darling. <laughs> open the door. She said, no, I want to, I want you to know my question. My husband doesn't find me sexually attractive. Do you? I said, open the door. So she wouldn't. She stood there. So I went around her, and I pulled her back, and I opened the door, and I walked out. And uh, she followed me. She followed me all the way to the front row. And I'm getting ready to go up and speak. And then she sat on the front row, and she's making signals towards me with her body. I'm like, finally, we stopped. I just isolated her and did the service. And sure enough, I mean, the more that I isolated her, the more she did the signals, the more the presence and the power of God, because I ignored it. And I knew miracles were going to happen. And sure enough, I prayed for everybody in that church that night. Finally, she confronted me out in the parking lot. But before she confronted me, I got a hold of the pastor. I told her, and he said, oh, my gosh. He said, uh, she works for a, she's a local stripper. And uh, I said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. And uh, finally, the pastor and his wife and her and I got together. And I just talked to her and said, listen. I said, I forgive you for what you did. First of all, I'm married, and I forgive you what you did. But I said, you got to realize you was used to the devil. Because if I yielded to looking at you, I yielded to what you were trying to do to me, people would not have been healed and set free that night. And I said, either you're going to give your life to Jesus, or are you going to give your life to this? And so we prayed for her, and we made... She made Jesus the Lord of her life. I came back there about six months later, and sure enough, she came back there with an usher this time and met me at the door when I came in, but I did not recognize her. She looked like a completely different woman. She said, do you remember me? I said, no, I don't. And uh, she said, I'm the all. I said, well, I remember you now. <laughs> so, boy, do I remember you now. So, and... Uh, I was so glad that she's completely free of that, completely gone of that. And again, God used me to help her in spite of this fact of what she tried to do to me. And listen, I feel for men. I mean, this was not an ugly woman at all. I mean, this was a very beautiful and attractive woman. But at the same time, I knew if what I did then could destroy my life and my calling. Destroy it. And it, sometimes you just, in the temptation with that, that night, I mean, I changed hotels. I was staying at one hotel. I changed to another. Then I changed that. And I left, I actually left Peoria and went all the way down to St. Louis to get into another hotel room. Because I wanted to be completely away from her and the situation. And I tell you what, it just, it, you know, God honors that. He honors that. He honors that purity. He honors that sincerity. And I tell you what, these are these are warfare points. And men, if you're if you're faced with that, listen, just you know, just just stay away from the phone by yourself, or stay away from the iPad. Don't yield to it. Don't do it. You know, you she may be pretty, and you can look once, but don't you look twice and be with your tongue hanging out and all this kind of stuff. It ain't worth it. It's just not worth it, guys. It's not worth it, and I, don't, I better stop because I'm, you know, I'm getting in some sensitive areas here. But as a pastor, as a man, I understand that, and temptation is there. But you know what? You can say no to it. You can yield yourself to the Spirit of God, and God can place you in a place of protection and a place of purity. Even if you mess up, you still run to God. He knows how to make it right. He knows how to restore things. He knows how to make things right. Again, hear my heart. 
Temptation is not a sin. Let's say it. Temptation is not a sin. But yielding to it is. Yielding to that spirit. Yielding to it. And when you yield to it, what you compromise to get, you'll, you'll lose. But if you compromise and, and you feel like, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm not, I'm not going to repent before God. No, no, no. R- run to him. He'll restore your life. He'll make it right. And I guarantee you with temptation that you don't yield to, you get stronger and stronger. You do. You really do. You come to a place where, no, I'm not going to do it. Now, don't be like the man I worked for, Jesse Duplantis. One time he got on an airplane. This woman was, uh, you know, she was, she was going after him. And he got up and called her all these kind of names in the name of Jesus and rebuked her on the airplane. I'm like, I don't do that necessarily. But he, he was confronting her. And uh, I'm like, well, that's Brother Jesse. But at the same time, I love people. I saw what that woman was trying to do. I see what others battle through. And so my heart goes out to him. But listen, it is a spiritual battle. And so when you walk into a place, just be spiritually in tuned and let God lead you. And remember, there's nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus. There's nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus. When you walk into a place, take charge, take control in his name. And that's what we're going to talk about. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we submit and commit these things to you. Lord, show us how to walk spiritually in the authority we have as a believer. That we're not going to yield to the flesh, we're not going to yield to the demonic, and we're sure not going to yield to the pressure. Because we belong to you. We're yours. Let's everyone say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my mind. I give you my body. And spiritually, I belong to you. No weapon formed against me will prosper. I cast down these imaginations, these high things that would try to destroy me. I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to walk in faith. And I'm going to walk in hope. And I'm going to refuse the enemy in every area. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, I want to pray with you. If you need help about any of these areas I mentioned, I'm here as a pastor, as a friend, as a man. To man, we'll get woman to woman to help you. We're here to help you, okay? Listen, you can win these battles. William and I were in a luncheon this week seeing, you know, the, the fight for men's souls because men are leaders. They're supposed to lead their households. We want to see men charged and empowered to lead. That's this Promise Keepers Network that we participate in this luncheon Wednesday. They're coming to Texas Stadium. This is not just a great event coming up this summer, but it's a move of God for men to rise up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And by the way, men, if you said no to it, if you've done things you shouldn't do, listen, just, just turn away from it. Just don't, don't give it no place. Just to say, listen, I, I, I fell into a trap. I messed up. Let's get up and go. Okay, let's go forward. Let's just, let's don't give it, give it place anymore. I'm serious. Don't give it place. Because if you don't give it place and the stronger you get in the Lord, the freer you get, then you appreciate what you have and what you've been given. I'm telling you what, I, you know, I thank God for, for my life and, and where I am. And I enjoy the fact that Jesus Christ is bigger than any problem that I've got. And I want to see you win in every area. And if you've got a need in your body, Shelby and Mr. Anderson and I and Dave, we want to pray with you in just a moment. If you, if you sense the presence of God moving over your body right now, some of you are dealing with some eternal things as far as in your stomach. Um, what I hear is, is the stomach issues and some things along the stomach and, and female issues too, as well as male. We want to pray and agree with you. We want to lay hands on you in a qualitative manner. We don't want to rush this at the end of the service. We want to pray the prayer of agreement. We want to anoint you with oil. We want to, we want to really pray and take authority over those things and see you free. See you free and see you helped in the name of Jesus. And see you enjoy your life instead of endure it. Listen, there, there's pressures that come, but please, I want you to hear me. I, I'm saying, I know I'm belaboring this point, but I'm closing with this. Some of you got to remember, temptation is not a sin, okay? It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to yield to it. Remember that Jesus was tempted. He's tempted with everything you're tempted with, but he didn't give into it. So don't, don't think, think, oh, well, I'm tempted. I've sinned. No, 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 uh-uh. 
No, no. Just because you're tempted doesn't mean you yield to it. All right, then. Is that, is that helping you? I, I, I want to help you some more, okay? And by the way, these next couple weeks, especially next week, you've got to learn the power in that name. When you speak the name of Jesus and you start talking to things in that name, you've got to realize it's not your power, it's His power, okay? It's not your authority, it's His authority. The authority of the believer has nothing to do with Brian or you or me or anything. It has everything to do with Him. So this is what we're going to learn over the next couple of weeks. We're going to talk to some things. Instead of talk to it and let, us, let it talk to us, we're going to talk back to it. Okay, we're going to talk to some things. And we're going to speak to some things in His name. And I'm telling you what, you're going to see some changes in your life. You're going to see some changes in your life. I'm serious. I had a good friend of mine, this same Pastor Tom. He lost over 150 pounds because he learned how to talk to his food. He did. He talked to Debbie Cakes and coconut cream pies. He said, I bind y'all. Not while he was eating it. I'm telling you, he said, I bind you. I bind, I'm not going to have that. I'm not going to be a fat man. And, uh, I mean, he was a big dude. As a matter of fact, he was in the prayer line one time. I'm praying for pregnant women. He was on the end, and I had my eyes shut, and I was going from woman to woman. Then I started praying for him, and I felt this hand pushed down. I put my hand back up, and it pushed down. I I thought, that's Pastor Tom. I was praying over his belly. He said, I'm not pregnant. (laughs) I know that you're a man, so I I just figured that out. So, but you had a big old belly, okay? And so anyway, um, my point with that is he spoke to his body. He spoke to it. He lost all that weight. He resigned his pastorship. And now he's traveling in Australia and other parts of Europe. And he is a, mission, he's a, he's a, he's a prophetic type teacher. And he is an excellent health, Mr. Atwood. You know why? One decision. He changed his life in 365 days by speaking to his body instead of his body talking to him. Because his body was driving him to eat. He was the most eatingest pastor I've ever been in my life. We ate everything. We'd have a prayer time, we'd go eat. We'd have a meeting, we'd go eat. We'd, have, we'd go eat breakfast, lunch, dinner. I, I, I said, well, man, I can't eat all this food. We, can't, we got to stop eating out all the time. And then all of a sudden, it changed for him. And God freed him and changed his life and set him in a whole new direction. Now he's a 60-year-old, looks like a football player type guy, strong and healthy and can go overseas, all because he learned his authority. Would you-